Thank you. So luxurious to get an introduction. Uh, so, like Liam said, my name is Stella Cotton. I am really, really excited to be here in Australia. If you've talked to me yet, um, I've probably just told you how much I love it here. Um, I've seen kangaroos and koalas in the wild, which I've probably also told you about. Um, and yeah, it's really amazing. And I just wanted to say a huge thank you, sorry, uh, to the organizers for all of their hard work. Like this is like basically my favorite conference. So I'm really grateful to be back. <laughs> So I work as an engineer on the tools team at Heroku. Um, and before we get started, unrelated to my job at Heroku, uh, I would like to ask you a favor. So I get really nervous when I'm up here speaking and um, I really should be drinking water, but everybody's staring at me and then I do a weird little dance. So I'm gonna steal a trick from my friend Lily. Uh, so every time I go and I grab my water, I take a drink. I want everybody to just start clapping and cheering and like losing your minds. So we're gonna practice, we're gonna practice, hold on. Ah, oh, that's awesome, cool. And then another point of order, um, I'm probably gonna go through the code samples pretty quickly, uh, but I'll tweet out a link to my slides after uh, the talk in case you wanna take a closer look at the code. So I have lured you all here today under this pretense that we're gonna learn how to write a tiny web server, the little server that could. But the reality is this talk should be called the little server that can't. If you wanna use this little server to do anything in production, you're gonna find that it's slower and it's not secure. And in some cases, we're just gonna say, you know what, we're not even gonna implement that. And it's also pretty important to note that a lot of the things that I'm gonna cover uh, are gonna be really limited to Unix-like environments. So they'll be familiar on Mac and on Linux, but um, it won't really apply to Windows machines. So why do we even care? Why are we here? What can the server do? To talk about what it can do, um, I wanna talk for a second about abstractions. And as engineers, a really powerful skill is learning when to dig into an abstraction and when to just accept the constraints. If every time you wanted to use a third-party API, you had to understand the internals of that API, you'd be wasting your time, and you'd be sacrificing the value of that API. It's an abstraction away from something that you just don't really need to know. And so these abstractions, they make your code stronger, they can be cleaner, um, it makes you manage your time effectively. Um, you've probably all worked beside or been that coworker who just like can't stop going down rabbit holes and they just can't manage, but like, if you respect the abstraction, then you can actually be pretty productive. But total real talk, I came to software late in life um, from something totally different, and I fight this urge to think of these abstractions as magical and as something completely unknowable. And good abstractions should feel like magic, but sometimes we need this reminder that they're just a tool. And servers are specifically a tool that probably everyone here is using every single day. And you run Rails S, like, you don't need to know what's happening underneath for the most part. The server just starts. It's powerful and it's a super easy to use abstraction. And it's so powerful that it can feel like magic. But servers are not magic. If you dig down past that abstraction, you're gonna find that it's just code. So we're gonna explore the components of the server um, and so if tonight you go home and you open up one of the open source Ruby web servers uh, on GitHub, you're gonna actually see some familiar components inside there. So our server, it's gonna help us understand what's happening inside of our production web servers. What else can this little server do? It's gonna be composed of some pieces that are so fundamental um, that it'll actually help you build a foundation that is gonna, it's gonna help you understand other cool things that are happening in the Ruby community. So it can help you understand things like, why was garbage collection such a big deal in Ruby 2? Why do we care about Koichi's concurrency model with guilds? So let's start off, talk about what is a server really? Specifically today, I'm talking about a web server. It's gonna run on a physical computer, which is somewhat confusingly also called a server. And you are probably using one of these common Ruby servers now. Unicorn, Puma, Webrick, and Dev. And people can interact with these servers by visiting a web page, using Telnet, Curl, 
And I'm gonna use client as an umbrella term to talk about all of these different methods. But in a lot of ways, it's just like any other program on your computer. It has code, it lives in a file, you can run it. And today, our little server, we're gonna kick it off with just Ruby server.rb. But what makes this server different than all of the web development code that we're writing inside Sinatra or Rails? One, it's gonna communicate directly with the outside world by leveraging the power of the operating system itself. And two, this communication happens over a very specific API. This may not sound like a big deal, but let's think, how many web pages are out there today? Anybody guess how many index web pages? Any guesses? That is too high. Anybody? Five web pages. No, gosh. Come on, y'all. I know we're all just wrapping up lunch, but oh, please help me out. Um, so it's 4.6 billion index web pages. And that was actually back in November. That number just goes up every time you check. Um, and it's getting served up from servers all over the world. And they're being viewed by mostly five different browsers, but on desktop and mobile. And the fact that all of these clients and all of these servers are all speaking in the same standardized language is mind blowing. Spoiler alert. Um, how is this possible? In my experience, if you ask five developers to come up and individually solve a problem, you're gonna get six different solutions. So this is the magic of a standards body who do the Lord's work called the W3C. It's the World Wide Web Consortium, and it's formed in 1994 to create standards that form the open web. They created this API that the whole web uses today to communicate over HTTP. And they established this in a document called RFC 2616. And it is a 175 page document that outlines the HTTP 1.1 API. And it's what we use every day. Unless you're using HTTP 2 that Hero talked about yesterday, and then your spec is gonna be a little different. But it's a giant contract for how we structure web requests and responses so that anyone in the world can talk to each other. Or to describe it another way, it's a list, like a huge list of tests that you would need to write if you wanted to create a production web server. It's not just saying that you need to support a web request that looks like this, which is like a pretty common sample for like what a GET request looks like. But it also has to say that like all of these URLs should return the same web page. Defines the entire interface between the open web and our applications. Amazing. And I first came across this RFC uh, when I was first learning about how a web server worked. So I Google like, how does a web server work? Which is what you do. And what comes up is this like stack overflow answer that says the only way to learn how, to web, how a web server works is to read this RFC, 175 pages, and implement it yourself. And so this is a conference talk, so I have to like make a meme reference, but it's like the most how to draw an owl shit I have ever read. <laughs> and I was so frustrated, because I'm like, oh, I'm not a real developer. I'm like a real developer, that's what I do every day. And of course, Stack Overflow is like making me feel like shit. And, you know, like you do. And because I couldn't take this like spec and turn it into a web server. So the reality is that this thing is amazing, but it's not really gonna help you build a web server. It's gonna help you if you're trying to build a production web server, because you need to be able to respect this contract, but it's not really gonna help you understand some of the fundamentals. So we're gonna respect the very basic contract um, so that we can curl and get a response, but we're gonna really focus on what's happening underneath. So we started off talking about generally what's a server, but now let's dig a little bit deeper. And servers in this like cool way are just all about communication. And um, you can kind of talk about three different ways that they're gonna communicate. All right, are you ready? I told Liam I was gonna do the weird little dance and I totally did it. I can't control myself. All right, so, so first we're gonna talk about how the little server 
is going to communicate with the outside world. At its heart, it's a program. It's running on your machine. Communicates in a few defined ways. And when you start up a program on your machine, Unix is going to create a little world for your program to run in called a process. And the idea of a process is you can assign variables, change the state inside your program without corrupting this global state in your operating system. Like any other program, you can see it running with PSOX. We can start it up, see it happening. And what's different, though, is that this is going to leverage the power of the operating system to communicate externally. And the Ruby standard library, very conveniently, um, will actually give you a small web server that you can run called Webrick. You don't have to do any of the stuff we're going to cover today. But it also provides a lot of cool wrappers around the common Unix system calls um, that will able, enable you to build your own. So this is the basic flow of how web ser our web server is going to work. First, we're going to open up a socket. And a socket is a way that processes on your machine or on, in a system can communicate, either with other processes that are on the same machine or with the outside world. You're going to hear people say things like, everything in Unix is a file. Sockets are no different. They're just a specific kind of, kind of file that both servers and clients can read and write to. If you want to take a look at what sockets are running on your machine right now, you can use NetStat, um, and it'll tell you. The operating system is going to identify all of these different files by a number. It's called a file descriptor, file handle, and Ruby is going to give us a higher level abstraction, so we don't need to keep track of that number. Um, but it's good to know that that's what the operating system is using to identify uh, the file that you're reading and writing to. So we're not just opening a socket. We're opening a very specific socket. And it needs to be a socket capable of accepting web traffic. And to specifically create a web socket, you need to choose your addressing format. Two most common formats, Unix, Internet. What's the difference? So some sockets are processes talking to other processes. Um, some are communications via the outside world. So Unix. You might see something like this on your file system, and it's a path name to the machine uh, so that two programs on the same machine can talk. Internet sockets are going to use an internet address, so anyone can talk to that process on your machine. So we're going to use an internet socket because we want to have the outside world talk to us. Second, you need to tell the kind of socket. Typically, we're going to hear about two types of sockets, stream versus datagram sockets. And stream sockets are going to be like a telephone. They're going to go back and forth. They're bidirectional. And the communication protocol is going to be TCP. It's based on two computers connected. They're going to chat back and forth. Here I reference the TCP three-way handshake yesterday. And this is how clients and servers establish a connection with each other. SYN and ACK are two bit flags. And they're going to be turned on as part of this process so that the client and the server both know that they're connected before exchanging information. So a client's going to be like, hi, it's Stella. And the server's going to be like, oh, hi, Stella. This is server speaking. How can I help you? And the client's like, oh, I'm here to get some information. And that's basically it, but with bit flags. <laughs> and so stream sockets are basically going to make sure that they've got this handshake, that they're both connected. But equally important is that everything has to come over in the correct order. Otherwise, your web page is going to look like shit. So the server will continue to send information over the socket, along with a sequence number. And the client will keep track of that order, even if something comes, comes out of order. So the TCP protocol, using a stream socket, great way to ensure that everything is arriving in the correct order. Your website looks great, but you're going to pay a price. It's a little slower to connect. Flip side, datagram sockets. They're like a megaphone. They only go one way. They're unidirectional, kind of like this talk. Um, and you don't actually care if anyone's around. Like, I'd still give this talk even if this room was empty. <laughs> there is no handshake, because the datagram sockets are just like DGAF. And in fact, not only are datagram sockets just yelling into a megaphone, if you were there, sitting around, listening to their communication, there's not a guarantee that those words are going to come out in the correct order. 
The benefit, though, is that it's very, very fast. The messages go very, very quickly because it uses UDP instead of TCP. Common real-world examples um, are going to be multiplayer games, streaming audio. Um, if you've ever done monitoring, StatsD is another example. Thank you. So over our web server, we're going to use what we learned to set up our socket. Internet communications protocol, aka an IP address, uh, communicate via TCP over a stream socket. Now that we have our socket, we need to give it an IP address to bind to. It's like generating a telephone number so that servers, that somebody can call into our server from the outside. We're going to bind the socket to that address so it knows that's its number. And finally, tell the socket, listen for incoming communications. Now we wait. We just listen. So we've got our socket set up. We're going to need to add a whole new method where we just loop forever and ever, continuously listening for requests. And when somebody dials our number using curl or visiting our website, accept is going to create a whole new socket so we can talk back and forth to the client. And so why can't we use that other socket? Because that socket has one job, accepting incoming communication. So we need a different socket because we don't want to mix up our data. So we rec receive the request off the socket. Now we're ready to do something. So we open the socket. We listen for the incoming requests. What next? Since it's a web server, usually we're going to return an HTTP response. So we'll add some application code. And now when we run this very lovely application, it's just going to say, hello world. And it's going to be formatted according to that RFC that we talked about earlier. We write the response back to our socket, close our socket so that somebody else can use it, and we're done. And this is basically how our tiny server is going to communicate with the outside world. It's going to repeat over and over and over every time a client makes a request, returning our favorite phrase in programming, hello world. So now that we're chatting with the outside world, let's talk more about how the server communicates with the application code that's running underneath. We're going to start off by talking about parsers. Before, when we started building our tiny web server, you can see we got the response, and we didn't actually do anything with it. We were just like, you're going to always get hello world. It's like, you get hello world, and you get hello world, but like in the real world, your users are actually going to want some kind of information. So how do you actually tell what they want? Web servers use a parser to do this, and a parser's job is to take that request break it down, um, and use those guidelines from RFC 2616, and break the request into pieces. It's going to extract header, body, URL. It needs to do it really quickly and really accurately and very securely. So even though you'll actually find production web servers written in Ruby, your parser is typically going to be written in C. I'm really not going to dig too deep into this, um, but one thing to note Zed Shaw wrote a pretty unique parser in uh, Raggle uh, for the Mongrel web server. It's found in most Ruby web servers. Um, and it's beyond the scope of this talk, uh, but it's going to be worth knowing about if you're digging into Ruby web server production code, uh, because most of them just copy this parser directly in, um, comments and everything. So now as we build up this like little server that can't, I'm just going to bypass building a parser because I don't know C. Um, and I'm just going to take some liberties, continue to assume that you just want hello world. So we talked about parsing. Next, let's talk about um, communication, communication with the application. Instead of like this hard-coded hello world, um, how can we modify our server so that we can plug in any application? Rails, Sinatra, any, anything that you're writing now. We can do that with the magic of Rack. And in the Ruby world, we have this really cool common interface for all servers and applications to communicate called Rack. Sinatra, Rails, they both use it, and it's what allows you to substitute in one server for another. This basic interface is really just that it needs to be a Ruby object, respond to a method called call, take an environment hash and only an environment hash, and return a response, status header body. 
This is just like a super simple, lightweight rack app. Ruby object, response to call, one argument, response, status header body. And before, we're just calling this like run application. I just sort of stuck everything into a string. But now, our server is always just going to say app.call. That's it. And it's just going to assume that everything that is running underneath knows that it's going to return back in um, something in that standard format. So that's exactly what we did here. So even if you switch to using Sinatra or Rails, you're going to get back the information that you need. So here's a cool GIF of our server running. It's chatting back and forth with the client. It's communicating with our application. That's a Rack application. It's really rad. Um, in fact, you can even have another client chatting with the server too. Life is super good. Except now, let's mix it up a little bit. We're going to go back to this Rack application. And instead of just saying, hello world, we're going to mix it up. We're going to make an external API call. And we're going to make a call to this Giphy API. I think you have Giphy in Australia, right? All right. And so it's going to download a new cat GIF every single time you visit your homepage. So I've added this sleep here for five seconds to illustrate it. And you can see on the left um, that you've got this waiting, and then the client one. It takes five whole seconds to get a response. Five seconds of waiting for one person is a lot. But as soon as you have another visitor that ha visits the page at the exact same time, you're going to be waiting 10 seconds for your cat GIF. That is unreasonable. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that's kind of arbitrary. Like, I made up, like, five seconds is way too long for a Maru GIF. But, like, even relatively fast calls out to an API can add up the more people are visiting your site. And you can use a grocery store analogy. Um, that basically, if you have one cashier checking people out, the more and more people get into line, the longer people wait at the end of the line. So each of these requests is having to wait on the request ahead of it. So how can we make go faster? Well, in the grocery store, we could add a new cashier. And one way to do that is to build a new checkout line. And in code, building a new checkout line, maybe we could fork our process. And we could create a whole other sub-process to download our cat gifts. So before, we're looping, we're listening to client requests, we're doing everything in line. But if we extract out that code, the part that receives a request and handles it, we can call fork on it, and it'll create a whole new process that'll call out to get our cat GIF. That means the parent process is still accepting requests without having to wait on Maru to come back. So now, if you run this, the two processes they aren't blocking each other. The first client gets their cat gift, second client gets their cat gift. It happens almost simultaneously. Still waiting five seconds, but not the 10 seconds we saw before. And then just as a final, final note, uh, don't forget to close the parent socket after you fork. You may screw up when you're forking. This happened a couple times to me when I was working on code for this talk. And then you try to start your server you get this address and use error because that old process is hanging around in the background, hanging onto your IP address. Um, you can kill the zombie processes, um, you know, using kill uh, and list of open files to get to get the process ID. This is just a side note uh, if you're looking at the slides later. So we'll go back to fork. At the end of the day, each child process that we fork is a copy of that parent process. And the boxes here are going to represent the separate memory that they write to. If any of these processes want to talk back and forth to each other to share information, they can't access each other's memory. They'll need to open a Unix socket, like we talked about earlier, um, to talk to each other. You may be asking yourself, I certainly did. Wait, aren't we going to double the amount of memory that we're consuming every time we call fork? Not exactly. So Unix has an optimization called copy on write which uh, Aaron mentioned very briefly in his talk, um, slightly more technical than I'm going to go, but um, a lot of the memory that's being taken up by your program is actually the code itself. That's static. That doesn't change on the fly. Um, the variables change, but that's only a, a fraction. And so there's a huge amount of memory duplication that you're going to get between the parent and the child. So Unix is actually going to be able to share that allocated memory between the parent and the fork child. And a, when a portion of that memory changes, 
Say you assign a variable, that's the part that's registered. So it copies the memory to a new page when the child tries to write to the memory. That's why it's called copy and write. And it means that the memory footprint of each of the children is going to be smaller than the parent process, right? Well, sort of, it depends. Pre-Ruby 2, unfortunately we were not able to take advantage of this and Ruby got a really bad rap for being a memory hog. And why is this? Because of garbage collection. Garbage collection, Aaron also briefly talked about, it's what allows us as Ruby programmers to allocate memory and never worry about bringing it back up again. Simple example, assigning the cat gift variable to awesome, we may never actually use this variable again. Um, and in a manually managed language, we're gonna actually have to tell it, free yourself, go back into the operating system. But Ruby actually does this for us with a garbage collector. Periodically runs through, checking, figures if memory is still in use. If not, they releases the memory back into the system. Very simplistically. And in the pre-Ruby two days, we paid a huge price for that abstraction that just allowed us to not manage our memory if we tried to fork a program. And why was that happening? It's because the garbage collector inspected the memory to see if it was in use, marked it if it was, the memory itself, which made the operating system think, oh, it's changed. So basically, none of the memory could be shared. And instead of each of the child processes having a smaller memory footprint, it's basically the same as soon as the garbage collector ran. But we live in the future. Narhiro Nakamura made a really rad change to the way the garbage collector works in Ruby 2.0. Um, I'm not gonna go into it here, but uh, the benefit is that it doesn't actually modify the memory itself. Um, and Ruby is able to take advantage of copy and write optimization. And if you wanna learn more, uh, Pat Shaughnessy's blog is really good um, and explains this really well. So this code is not perfect. Little server that can't. If you had a lot of clients trying to reach out and hit the server at once, you're gonna keep forking forever. It's, you know, you're eventually gonna run out of memory. So if fork is a way to run processes parallel, but you're concerned about running out of memory, maybe you're like, oh, I've heard that threads use less memory. Why not try threads? Why not? What exactly is a thread? It's the smallest bit of programmable instructions that can be coordinated by the operating system. Many threads can be a part of the same process in a multi-threaded system. Uh, they share all the same resources, specifically memory. There's no copy on write here because the threads all actually access the same memory space and can write to it, which is awesome. It uses less memory. The threads are gonna die when the process dies so you don't get these weird zombies when you screw up. Much faster to communicate because it doesn't have to build a socket. Um, so why, why don't we use it all the time? Well, one reason is that a version of Ruby that most of us are probably using today, MRI, doesn't really support true parallelism. Why not? Because of the global interpreter lock. And if you aren't familiar with this, the global interpreter lock is, uh, it means that even in a multi-threaded program, only one thread is actually executing Ruby code at any given time. So you might be thinking, cool, we can use threads. Ruby like takes everything, it takes care of everything. Like we don't have any of those weird side effects when a bunch of copies of your program share the same memory space. Like Ruby does all that for us, but that's not the case. Um, the GIL, it guarantees that only a single operation in Ruby is thread safe. So what would that mean for code that we write? Here we've got a really simple method, just checks more than zero cat toys available, allow somebody to buy one. Otherwise we'll tell them unavailable. But in a multi-threaded multi system, the GIL can context switch between the two and cause race conditions. So you look at the top left, thread one is gonna say, are there any cat toys available? The number is still gonna be more than zero, it's just gonna be one, so it's like, yeah, I got one left. But GIL is like, oh, I'm done, single Ruby operation, I've already done something, let me switch to thread two. First thread didn't actually check the cat, it didn't actually purchase your cat toy. So when you look at thread two on the right, it's gonna try to buy it. But then if you context switch back to thread one, there are gonna be no cat toys left, even though the program will still think that there is. 
So the GIL is super valuable because it protects the Ruby language itself from race conditions, but it doesn't actually help us write thread safe code. So why would you use a multi-threaded server with MRI? Server like Puma, for example. Um, well, it might make sense for sure if you're writing in JRuby or Rubinius because you can actually take advantage of multi-threading support. Is there any benefit with MRI? Well, if your app is doing a lot of external API calls, you could actually see a performance improvement because in that scenario, you're not waiting on Ruby code. Your threads are blocked. That's, that's, that's not what's supposed to happen. Another weird dance. This one's for you, Liam. To start. <sighs> All right. Why use a multi-threaded server with MRI? Um, because you're, if you're using a lot of, doing a lot of API calls, your threads are going to be blocked, um, but not by Ruby. It's going to be blocked by external calls, so it might actually have performance improvements. But at the end of the day, if you're writing a multi-threaded server, that's going to be a lot harder. <laughs> Um, but if you're even running a multi-threaded server, you do have to make sure that your code itself is thread safe and any gems that you're using are thread safe. And it's going to be beyond the scope of this talk to talk about how you can do that, but um, I do have some resources if anybody's interested. So third step, communicating with the outside world using sockets, communicating with the application using the mighty power of rack or using a parser. We're even handling multiple clients with forking. Lastly, we're just going to quickly talk about how you, as a human, can talk to your process. You can do that using signals and traps. And signals are just a way that you can interact with processes that are running on your machine. You can see all the signals that your operating system supports with kill-l. It's not going to be the same on all the operating systems, unfortunately. But the most common ones will be supported, and the most common signal of all is going to be fired when you do control C. And it fires the interrupt signal, and your program will know I need to shut down. And in our, in our little server code, we can actually use something called a trap, and that's going to actually trap that signal that you send, and it can execute some code before your process shuts, shuts down. Here we're just trapping it, and printing terminating so that the user knows that we've heard them and that we're going to shut down gracefully. It's a little bit arbitrary here, but in a situation where you have a really long running job and your web application needs to be restarted because of a deploy, for example, and there's no way this job is going to be able to finish up before um, the interrupt, between the interrupt signal getting fired and the kill signal getting fired, um, you can store how far along that you were by trapping that signal, doing the store, and then continuing on, um, and you can pick it up later. One signal you cannot trap, that's sig kill or signal nine, and that's going to immediately terminate any process uh, that sent the signal, and it will do no signal handling. So wrapping up today, we've talked about what a server is, how it can communicate. Along the way, we've written a little server that really can't do everything, but uh, hopefully you've learned some cool Unix tricks. Uh, you'll be able to navigate the mysteries of production servers in the future. Um, I'll send out a link on Twitter uh, to my slides if you want to take a look at any of the, any of the information here. But um, also, I have stickers, Heroku stickers. Hello, server speaking. Um, <laughs> if you want to come by and get a Heroku sticker um, or some like weird patches, uh, come say hi to me. I'd be happy to chat afterwards. Thanks.